In this InspiredInsider.com interview, we talk with David Garfinkel. He's known as one of the world's greatest copywriting coaches. He talks about a campaign that he created that generated $40 million in sales and why that worked. Also, he talks about why he reads the National Enquirer and why he was in it. That and much more coming up right now. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have David Garf Garfinkel, who's one of the legends of copywriting and direct response marketing. And we're using Google Hangouts for the first time. This should be interesting. Um, just a little bit about David. Uh, he's known as the world's greatest copywriting coach. And some of his students include Mike Morgan, who is the top performing sales letter for Agora Financial, Jim Clare, lead copywriter for the number one product on all of ClickBank, Chris Haddad, who has produced many top sellers in the relationship category. The list goes on and on. And David's clients include companies such as IBM, United Airlines, Time Life Books, many more. A lot of his clients are actually smaller or entrepreneurial companies. And you may have not actually heard of them, but chances are you've bought their products. Uh, and one quote I read was, David Garfinkel is the best copywriter I have known. And it was by J. Conrad Levinson, who is author of, famous author of Guerrilla Marketing. And, and David is the author of Amazon bestseller Breakthrough Copywriting. David, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, you're welcome, Jeremy. It's a pleasure to be here. Even with all the technical glitches, you are very patient, and I appreciate that. <laughs> I've been trying to do video on the web for years, and I'm just used to it. Yeah, I could I could take my shirt off and show you all the tire tracks on my back. I'm, I'm sure as a doctor you've seen that before, but anyway. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, I want to start off the interview with uh, your bestseller, you know, Breakthrough Copywriting, and I want to hear, you know, you were a screenwriter and you're a master storyteller. I want to hear one of your favorite stories from the book. Okay. Well, um, my, my favorite story of the book, because I'm an author, actually is not within the covers of the book, but the whole process of launching it and promoting it. I was stunned and, and humbled by the response I got from other top copywriters, Joe Sugarman and um, Bob Bly, who is, you know, AWA Copywriter of the Year, and one of my early teachers, great man. And uh, Mike Morgan, one of my students, who's just killing it at Agora right now, uh, that blew me away. Uh, if you go to Breakthrough Copywriting on Amazon, you'll see their reviews. There's 19 of them. Um, I did not tell them what to write. I, some people bought the book. Some people gave away a copy of the book. But I said, let the chips fall where they may. And these are people who are not going to BS you you know, because they got a reputation to protect. So, right. you know, and it's not my first book. I mean, I have, a, I've done a, I've, it's like fifth or sixth or seventh book, and I'm actually a publisher and part of a, a publishing company. I publish other people's books, but I'll tell you, being a best-selling author, there's just nothing like it. So that, that's, that's, you know, uh, the, the damn thing is that, Jeremy, I go down to Starbucks, I give them dollar seventy-five, and I get a cup of coffee at, it hasn't changed, even though I'm best-selling author. But it, 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 <laughs> they yeah. don't recognize you yet. Not yet. I don't know. I guess they're not copywriters. Whatever. You know, Maybe. I find it interesting, David, that the copywriters are meet are no BS people. Do you find that to be a trend? Very, very much so. And why? Um, well, the kind of copywriters that write direct response copy, and that's what entrepreneurs, and I think your audience is, is entrepreneurs, people who have businesses, right? For so, sure. So uh, as much as I love the Miracle Mile in Chicago, most of the guys on North Michigan Avenue are writing different types of copy than what we're talking about because their copy only has to be memorable, you know, Charlie the Tuna and Jolly Green Giant. The kind of copy that we write has to sell something. Right. So in order for us to sell something, we have to know more about what's going on in the brain and the heart and the gut and the 
um, gonads of the person right. we're selling to than they do themselves. Yeah. And so... Tell me about that, actually. Tell me about one of the small entrepreneurial companies you work with and how you kind of dug into the gonads of one of the sure. campaigns. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll tell you about my biggest win, which happened, unfortunately, early in my career. I, I mean, it, it's, it's unfortunate in that it's frustrating because I haven't been able to repeat the win, but it's, it's good motivation to keep trying. You it think was, this is always going to be like this, right? It's always going to be like happened. that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, having success early in life is a mixed blessing. But anyway, this was a company in Phoenix called Abacus Travel. And this is way back in the 90s before Expedia and Orbitz and, uh, you know, and uh, Priceline, Shatner, all that stuff. And so what they had is they had what they called a business-to-business -business travel service where they would actually go into a company's, another company, another entrepreneurial company's office, set up a ticket printer, and they would track you. They would, you know, follow you across the country, make sure the limo showed up and all, all these things that was fairly rare. And it's a wonderful business. Their their clients loved them. They had like movie companies and summer stock theater and a few entrepreneurial companies. But the only way they were able to get business was through referrals, um, which you know is is tough because you can't force people to give you referrals, so you can't depend on it as a way to get new business. Yeah. So they hired me to write a sales letter for them. What I found is what they were actually selling was not what their prospects wanted. Let me explain. Their prospects were people like you and me, people like people watching this probably. They were people, entrepreneurs, who, you know, the <laughs> got this, um, uh, you know, this, this screensaver from, uh, or this uh, mouse pad, not this one, but a mouse pad from, from uh, Best Buy, and it said, the great thing about owning your own business is you only have to work half days. And the best part is you get to choose which 12 hours. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so that's, that's, that's your prospect, right? I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Um, more like, like 18 hours, but yeah. More like 18, okay. Yeah. Well, that was, that was back then. You know? <laughs> yeah. that's, that's a little tougher. So, um, so they were offering all of this stuff for the, for the entrepreneur's business, but what the entrepreneur really wanted was someone to appreciate how hard they were working. You know, I mean... You know, their their gonads were, you know, a little little blocked. They needed to go on some vacation and release all of that um, kundalini energy with their wife or partner or whatever. Okay, is that gonady enough for you? I I don't think I've said the word gonad so much in an interview ever, but yeah. Well, I figure you're a doctor, so I can I'm say these you. things to I'm you. With yeah. you. Okay. Yeah. Right. So anyway, um, so what we did is we came up with this was great. We got a letter of Jaguar and Lexus owners on the assumption that someone who's going to spend that much money on a freaking car is probably doing it because they made it and either they want like five minutes of peace a day when they're driving the thing or they want everyone else to know how well they're doing, which was a good assumption. We sent them this letter and the letter said, take the vacation that you deserve. And of course, since entrepreneurs are always trying to push each dollar as hard as they can, said, you know, you're going to get champagne service on a beer bottle budget. And and then, and you know, they had the bona fides. I mean, one of their, uh, uh, their vice president had worked as vice president of two other airlines. They really knew the system. And they, they knew how to get people great deals and great service. So the deal, oh, and then we threw in a kicker. And I had a lot of help on this, by the way. Uh, I had people coaching me. I went through seven rewrites of this darn thing. It was, it was quite a... Uh, Quite an experience. Anyway, one of the suggestions was offer the business owner a box of Godiva chocolates just for having a meeting with them. Okay. Now, this is okay, except they were in Phoenix. Phoenix. And when it came summertime, they had to go buy these huge bags of dry ice just to take the thing across town so it wouldn't melt. Anyway, they eventually had stuff. They got $5 million a year worth of business out of mailing this out of a out of an HP laser printer with a plain stamp, you know, using a very simple uh, sort of ambiguous envelope and plain printed letter, no letterhead, no logo, no graphic design, no branding, no 
any of this crap, just a simple letter talking to this person right to their heart about, hey, this is how you're feeling. I know how you're feeling. That's the whole no BS thing, right? And I'd like to do something for you. And the, the most amazing thing is people have the meetings. Nobody wanted the vacation. Entrepreneurs don't take vacation. They need to have the word defined for them. But they like the idea of the service. So it was really two different things. One was getting in the door and the other was selling the actual service. And that's actually an important lesson that people will often respond to you for a different reason than they'll buy. And if you try and speed up that process or congeal it too much, you're in trouble. Yeah, yeah. And so could you just say for everyone, um, so they get it, what was the headline again? Just so you can repeat that. Because I think there's a lot of subtleties there that, you know, the, the beer bottle service, will you say it again? Yeah. Do you mind if I look it up exactly? Yeah, because go ahead. Go I, ahead. I don't have it. I'm just going to look it up on my computer now. Sure. It'll only take us. Sure. Take and us. I'm sure a lot went into writing that one sentence. And so I just wanted to get it, um, you know, reiterated and have you kind of talk about it for a second. Sure. Okay. I found it. Um, I'm opening it up now. Um, that's one thing I love about a Mac is that you can you can search it really fast. There are some things I don't love, but uh, I mostly love having a Mac. All right, so it's opening. Uh, Microsoft Word is. So you said you had a lot of help too. Um, so who did you who did you get to help you with it? Um. Okay. Um, I, I just found it. Let me see. If I, Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so um, I'll read you the headline and then I can talk about the help. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So the headline was. Take the luxury vacation of your dreams at a reduced cost because of this special offer. Th those are the actual words. Okay. Because um, I like your beer, I had a beer bottle service line, actually. <laughs> that yeah, you, that you had I, I, I do too. Um, I, I wonder if I if, if that's just developed in my mind. I'm, I'm looking through the letter now. Uh, we never actually, I don't think we ever actually use that. That's just sort of how I describe it. You have to beat the control now, right, with your new title. I know. Yeah, except they sold the company. Otherwise, no. I would try it. They, no, they had to stop mailing it. They could. It wasn't just the Godiva's um, melting. It was they couldn't, uh, they couldn't take any more business. They got $5 million worth of business in those days, not today, wow. but in those days. Travel was operating at a 10% margin, which means that added half a million to their bottom line right. every year. And when they sold the company, you know, there are multiples. And when a company's making that much money, they get sold at a higher valuation. Sort yeah. of financial gobbledygook, but, um, but important, I think. Yeah, and there's another, you know, David, there's another chapter in your book um, that I wanted to ask about too, which sure. is uh, the secret that works every time. Obviously, you know, you're a master copywriter. All the titles are going to draw me in, but I wanted to ask about a few. Um, one of them being the secret that works every time. Absolutely. So the secret that works every time is more conceptual than technical, meaning it has to do with research and trends over time. There are certain themes. I call them copywriting DNA. There are certain themes that, that when executed well to in a way that resonates with your market work every time. Um, there are seven of them in the book. I'll, I'll give you one of them um, that, that you might like. Uh, it's, it's number three. It's your unrecognized greatness has been discovered. Okay. Now, the fact is everyone, well, first of all, I, I like you. I'm very inspirational, inspired. Um, I believe everyone does have greatness inside them, and most people are going to take it to the grave. And some people, especially entrepreneurs, are seeking it. Some have found it. You know, someone like Joe Sugarman, obviously, has found it with the blue blockers and everything he's done. And um, and, and there are others. Um, and, and that's a lot of part of the work I do. But I think everyone either knows this about themselves or believes it, even though they don't really know it. And so if you can write a, a sales letter or an ad that speaks to that theme, your unrecognized greatness has been discovered, it's going to work. Um, and the best example is Gary Halbert's uh, coat of arms letter where he sent out a letter 
to people based on mailing lists in the phone book where uh, he said that our research has discovered a coat of arms you know with the Weiss family name or with the Garfinkel family name which is sort of funny because I th I'm Jewish, maybe you are too. There weren't too many Jewish coats of arms in Europe. <laughs> and, right. and for most people, maybe there weren't. But what this implies, of course, is that you are actually royalty and we have proof of it. And for $3, we'll send you that proof. And that's actually sort of in somebody's DNA if, if they have royalty. Um, that was probably the most successful direct mail letter ever mailed. At, at least at a time it certainly was. It might be right up there with the Wall Street Journal letter, which was the most profitable one ever mailed, but it was selling a more expensive product than the coat of arms. Uh, and, you know, Gary was absolute genius, period. You know, he, he I, I was talking to a friend of mine, Scott Haynes, who was one of his last um, protégés, and he said, you know, he would go to a restaurant with Gary, and Gary would say, Watch that woman at the bar. She's a pro. In about three seconds, she's going to sidle up to the guy. And, you know, that happened. He said, now watch this. And he pissed off the, the waiter. And the waiter came back. So he's going to be really passive aggressive, but he's going to pretend he's really nice. And, and everything Gary predicted happened. And um, How did he know that? What was it about him or his studying or personality that allowed him to, to be that good? I'm going to guess he thought about these things more than anybody else. And, you know, we talk about science. I think Gary was a scientist in a very unconventional way. He would try things. He would test them. They worked. He would test them in a larger scale. And he would he, he probably had a whole series of, of statistics, almost like spreadsheets in his head, maybe not in a traditional sense. So he would just keep investigating. One of, one of the things that I've found is that if you think on a problem long enough, you, you come up with answers nobody else has ever come up with. And I think that was, you know, Gary's situation. Yeah. And there's another part of your book which I want to bring up, which is a chapter about one sentence that can close the sale for you. Yeah. I, I actually made a note about that. Um, the one sentence that can close a sale is a bullet point. And here's what I mean. You get a sales letter, and, you know, so you, here, here's the sales letter, and there are all these little bullet points in there. You might be reading it, reading it, reading it. All of a sudden, there's this one bullet point, and you go, wow, I got to have that. And it's like you're buying it just for that one bullet point. For so sure, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll give you an example from one of my products, and I honestly don't remember which one it was. Five simple steps that subtract two or more hours out of every copywriting assignment. Well, anyone who spent hours and hours in copy, if I can have those two hours back, or even if I can have those two hours in the future, I'd, I'd like this just for that. So one bullet point, and again, that comes from the thinking. What is this product going to do for my prospect? What, How is it going to make their life better, easier? How is it going to save them time, save them money? How is it going to make them happier, healthier? How is it going to reduce pain? How will it increase pleasure? When And so you go through all those things and you come up with these bullet points and people read the bullet points or they hear them if it's a video script or audio script and wow uh, they buy. So what what bullet points do you have that you used because um, you obviously have had a lot of products and coaching what what did you find when you were talking to your clients that that jumped out at them when reading your copy? Oh my gosh um, if you could be more specific I could tell you that I mean, <laughs> You know, it, it. I can tell you there are different categories of things. Mm -hmm. um, if if it's a business offer, um, any any specific way that the offer makes money that you can present that is not even absolutely believable but plausible, like it could be true, will will usually work. If it's overhyped and it's in really flagrant, um, you know, uh, ex, you know. Uh, Exaggerated language probably won't work. So I, I have the seven reasons people buy you. I'm going to give them the seven yeah, reasons. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And, and then any bullet point written around these, and there's an eighth one too. So the seven reasons are make money, save money, save time, save effort, increase pleasure, reduce pain, and this should be your favorite one as a doctor, improve health. Okay. And the eighth one trumps them all. It's increased prestige. Hmm. 
So people buy a Rolex watch, people drive a Mercedes, people get a house on the hill, people, you know, um, that prestige, I mean, they'll spend endless amounts of money for, uh, you know, women buy these very expensive handbags, and not to pick on women, but, you know, men, women, humans, we all do this, so that's, yeah. that's how. Yeah, I like that, thank you. And I sure. always like to include a fun fact. Um, so a fun fact about you, tell me about your screenwriting days. Well, it, it started out when I lived in Chicago, as we were talking just before we started the broadcast. Um, I lived in Chicago from 1981 to 1984, and I really wanted to get out of journalism. I was working too hard for too little money, and everything was so negative, and just wasn't, you know, and I wasn't allowed to take sides. If I believed in something, I wanted to be, I could only be negative, you know, and criticize things. So I decided I want to write a screenplay, and I learned that screenplays that work are funny. So I said, well, the only way I'm going to know what's funny is by actually doing stuff to be funny. So I, I went to Players Workshop at Second City, hmm. and um, I, I really enjoyed that. I, I loved that a lot. Um, it, th this is not, by the way, I was not part of the Chicago Theater Group or the touring company. This was like a open thing. I, I need to make that real clear. You know, I wasn't hanging out with Bill Murray or anything like that. Right, Chris Farley uh, or Bill Murray or whoever, yeah, around that. Yeah, <laughs> would, would have been great if I had, but I wasn't. Right. But I did get a teacher out of that who had written a screenplay. It was <clears throat> the shooting script for David Mamet's, um, the movie version of David Mamet's play Sexual Perversity in Chicago, which, and the movie was called About Last Night. I think it had... Uh, 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 John Belushi's brother in it, I think. Jim Belushi was in it. Anyway, so she was my screenwriting teacher, and <clears throat> I, excuse me, I studied screenwriting for many, many years. I finally came to the conclusion that I loved learning about writing screenplays. I didn't really love writing them. I didn't like the movie industry too much, and I love watching movies, so I figured I'll just stick to what I like and not do what I don't like, because I, re I remember one time, you know, I live in San Francisco. I was at this uh, screenwriting uh, seminar in L.A., and a guy said to me, where do you live, Dave? And I said, San Francisco. He said, oh, that's interesting. You know, when a screenwriter gets really successful, he'll get a house in Sausalito, just across the bay from San Francisco, or in Mendocino up the coast. And I didn't say this out loud, but I thought to myself, so... Wait a minute, I want to go down to L.A. where nobody seems to enjoy living. They all complain about it so that I can come back to where I am now after suffering a lot. <laughs> Why? <laughs> so. That's good. Um, and I want to talk about, obviously, you know, going back a little bit, I want to hear kind of where your inspiration comes from, your influence comes from. What was a big influence for you growing up? Well, actually, my dad. Um, so my dad was a nuclear physicist. Too, really? Really? Sort of yeah, he was. He worked for the um, what was then called the National Bureau of Standards. Now it's called NITS or NIST or something like that. And he worked um, with very small, I don't think he made bombs, at least not as far as I know. He worked with very small amounts of radioactivity, uh, measuring standards for isotopes for different medical uses. At least that's the story I was told. <laughs> and one day, not one day, but one, at one time, his boss man, a guy named Wilfred Mann, I mean, he the man, Wilfred Mann, he was writing a book, and he invited my dad to write a chapter, and I remember my dad went through so much pain and so much misery just writing this one chapter, and so I went up to him, and I was about 15, and writing has always come easily to me. Now, writing well is as hard for me as anyone else, but just getting something down on paper is easy. So I said to him, you know, Dad, um, Dad, c could I help you? You know, because how old were you at the time? I was like 15 or something. All right. Yeah. yeah. I said because you know, writing's writing's not hard for me. Maybe I can help you. I know it's so hard for you, and you're so good at other things. And, and he said, David, that's that's really nice of you, but you don't know anything about Madame Curie and blah 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 and, and all, all this. So. So you, you couldn't, but, he said, but if you could help people learn 
how to write more easily, more quickly, without so much pain. That would be a wonderful thing. Hmm. And you, you know, Jeremy, I think that stuck with me. And I think that even though I had a career, you know, maybe for 15 years just writing, not not helping others, eventually I, I came back to that. I think it stuck with me. And that's one reason that I'm coaching people and coming out with products to help people write copy. Because I do think that for most people, writing copy is the hardest thing to do. And it's also the most, for a business person anyway, it's the most valuable thing to do. Yeah. And there's def definitely, obviously, a different skill set with writing copy and coaching. What have you found that you've cultivated with um, your coaching uh, skills that make you successful? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, I don't know. Let me let me think about that. Well, you know, I started coaching um, in about really coaching copywriting seriously. I've been coaching for a long time. It's just sort of my nature, my my uh, just part of what I do, the way I'm I'm wired. But I was in a a screenwriting class in Marin County, north of San Fran, and there were. Two girls in the class, one of them was a reporter working for newspaper, and one of them had was a published novelist. And they noticed I was always drawing analogies between copywriting and, and screenwriting, and and I was happy about copy. And I had a new car, and they were barely scratching by. And one day, one of them came up to me and said, David, would you teach us how to do this thing you called copywriting? And I said, and, you know, being the entrepreneur and, you know, being the guy likes to record. I said, well, I'll tell you what, if you'll let me record it and you'll let me sell it, including the part that you're on, I'll do it for you. And so they thought about it and they said yes. And that was when I started. And actually, I didn't know what the shit I was doing. I really didn't. Because, but here's why. It was for a good reason. I thought that if I could get other people to think the way I had learned to think about mm -hmm. copywriting, that would do it. The thing I didn't really um, acknowledge or even know maybe is most people don't want to think or they don't want to be taught how to think. They, they actually want to have stuff done for them or they want it to be really easy. Okay, so you live and you learn. What, what I've learned as a coach is actually, so in terms of my products, I eventually evolved to book like the Advertising Headlines book, which is about it's easy for writing advertising. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's about as easy for writing advertising as possible. What I found out when I came out with that book shocked me. It stunned me. Um, I, I wrote it as a lead-in product to one of my other courses, and I found out that the people who liked it most were the professional copywriters. And I remember Audrey Lanford. I don't know if you've ever heard of Audrey. Wonderful mm. woman. She, she was an Inc. 500 entrepreneur, um, scary smart as a doctor from Stanford. Her husband designed satellites for NASA, you know. And she was one of the people who loved it the most. And, and it was people like that. So that, you know, was sort of a wake-up call for me. Um, but anyway, that's at the product level. People who want to be coaching, I have, I have, <coughs> I actually took a, <clears throat> graduate course, a PhD level course in coaching, year long course. I was like the, you know, most disruptive student there. I was challenging every other thing they were saying because they were basically telling us to be, you know, passive mirrors of people we were coaching and not to have an opinion and not to instruct. And I said, well, maybe that works for life coaching, whatever that is, but sure doesn't work for coaching people, you know, with a skill like copywriting. Right. But, um, so I, I've studied a lot. Most of the things I've studied didn't work in that realm. What's worked actually well is sports, sports coaching, and particularly the work of Daniel Coyle, C-O-Y-L-E. He wrote a couple of great books, The Talent Code and The Little Book of Talent. And, and you know, he I don't really like Malcolm Gladwell. In fact, I just really dislike him a lot. Um, mm. But he was the guy who has popularized the uh, notion of Eric Anders' work of 10,000 hours, deliberate practice, mastery by doing something 10,000 right. hours. Um, I think what Malcolm Gladwell, ha what uh, Daniel Coyle has to say about that is much better. And so now when I'm coaching people, I'm working on a few different levels, but the, 
the main thing I want to say is I work on their weaknesses and because usually when you're going the kind of people I'm working with really want to excel and they want to excel at the top of a very narrow pyramid where the competition is brutal and it's unforgiving and it's not feel-good Oprah kind of stuff it's more like war or martial arts um, special forces. I Sometimes mean, it, literally, right? They're selling martial arts or, or some... Oh, yeah. One, one of my clients teaches people how to kill somebody with a few moves, but only as a defensive martial art. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, so uh, so I, I'm, I, I don't come in like the tough guy coach and not the Bill Belichick. I, I, I mean, actually I, did picture you like that. Before we came on air, I did picture you like a Bill Belichick type. Tell me why, if you don't I, mind. I don't know, actually. I'm trying to think. Because I think when I said, okay, we're going to record on Skype, or like, I despise Skype. Or, you know, just very definitive, yeah. very definitive answers. I'm, I, I, I am very blunt, but yes. see, my, my hero in coaching is Pete Carroll. Who's who is uh, the coach of the? I guess they they're world champions, aren't the they? The Seahawks. The Seahawks, and yeah. you know, a lot of people think he's all Oprah y and you know, but he's not. He, he's he's what he is is he recognizes the individuality of each player, and he's very positive. And I think I saw a survey that said forty two percent of free agents said they'd rather play for Coach Carroll than anybody else. Wow. But but he's he's also very firm and you know very. Um, you know, focused on eye on the prize, focused on the outcome, and but but he, he he's respectful. So I mean, I'm so I've studied positive psychology. I really like that a lot. I realize that I've I've seen one stat maybe that if you're coaching somebody and you praise them, you can get about a 12 times better um, return in terms of development than if you criticize them. But there there comes time when it's got to be you know. Pedal to the metal and and hammer and tongs and uh, so you you have to know when and how and it it depends on the person too. I mean, I remember I was describing this to somebody. Um, I have two clients that I love and respect very much, and they're as different as the day is long. One is a professor in Singapore, PhD, and I'm starting to work with him. He wants to learn copywriting. He has a dating academy. So the first thing. Wow. I, and he said, I've been reading these books, David. What books should I read? Now, PhDs read like three books a week or something. So I gave him a list of 36 books. I have, a, I have another client who is a, like a number one real estate sales guy in Canada, in his province. And his strength is relationships. He's incredible. Once you talk to him, he's yours. And so... I, I'm not giving him a list of 36 books. I'm looking at how he can leverage the relationships that he has to further his goals in developing his own coaching and copywriting practice. Uh, so I, I don't know. I'm sort of rambling all over the place, but uh, no, I get what you mean with a coach. It's you see them as individuals, so it's not like a set thing. And you look at everyone as that individual and kind of gear towards what they're best at and what they can do to kind of accentuate that. Absolutely. That that's it in a nutshell. That's perfect. Yeah. And so what did you tell that person with the relationships? What did you tell them to do first? Um, I told him to make a list of the people he knew and figure out how he can go talk to them and and you know to simply put together a one sheet with a headline and six bullets because I knew once he got into a conversation about any of those things, they would buy from him if 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 he if he got to interact with them. And it was funny because he had been so brainwashed by all of these other info marketing guys that he thought he had to have these long, noisy sales letters. And, blah. and I said, no, no, your strength is face-to-face, one-on-one, talking. Um, so, you know, I mean, that, that, that's interesting because you get to the, the idea of, um, what, I can't even remember now that, that, uh, that 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 DNA thing. Your unrecognized greatness has been discovered. Most people can't see themselves very objectively, it, mm-hmm. and and very often people have strengths that a they don't realize. B are so easy for them they can't imagine anyone would pay them any money for them, and so they tend to undervalue that. But you know, very often that is 
the the reason that is their greatness that once it's discovered and once they own it and simply offer it to the world and it's usually a very specific thing right like Mike Morgan for example copywriter Mike put the first bond trading company online uh, bondtrader.net or something in 1996 and the dot com uh, dot bomb sort of kept him from cashing in and then he got into copywriting and now he's writing for Agora on financial newsletters which is about what buying stocks and bonds well you know it's very easy for me to say this in retrospect you know what they say um, uh, hindsight is always 2020 right but for Mike to see that for me to see that and I've worked with Mike a lot and he's a great guy uh, took took a while and he had to go through, he wrote a lot of launches for a lot of people. He wrote a lot of VS, a lot of webinars, a lot of stuff. So, you know, one, one of my sayings, Jeremy, is the answer is always simple. Mm -hmm. Getting there is never simple. Yeah, so why is that? So as a coach, you accelerate that, right? So how did mm -hmm. you accelerate that in him or someone else so that they you found their kind of what they should be doing. Like in his case, maybe he did all this other stuff, but then he ended up with the, in the bond market where he should have been all along. How did you get him to that point, or how do you accelerate that for someone? Okay, so first of all, I'd, I'd like to challenge one thing. Said. It's not that he should have been there all along, because if he weren't at the level he's at now, he would not have the number one um, selling letter. I mean, he had so many things he had to learn. He knew everything about the subject area, but then there was all this stuff. Like the about training copyright. ground type of that he had to go through. Yeah. Um, secondly, um, as much as I'd like to accelerate it, because often I see it right away. Sometimes I don't, but more often I do. Getting someone else to see it is not always easy, especially if they... You know, I'm reading this book called The Future of the Mind by uh, uh, Michio Kaku. It's a, a new book. And he's, he's talking about some research they've done with people who've literally had their brain split. I mean, physically split, surgically or, or whatever. Like the and corpus callosum cut in half or something. Like the corpus callosum cut in half, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I'm, I'm probably getting the examples a, a, a little wrong here, but um, he, the the, the the point is still good that there was this one guy and somehow they were able to get his left brain to to communicate and, and he said I want to become an architect and somehow they were able to get the split right brain to say I want to be an automobile racer okay but he would never had any conscious contact with that wanting to be an automobile racer before the accident and and the brain split and all that that's that's what you run into all the time when you're a coach that and and probably when you're a parent and probably when you're a career counselor and probably when you're a doctor probably all these you know when you're helping people you find out that they can't even see what they really want you know what, what, uh, so you know Perry Marshall right or you know who he is mm -hmm. yes uh, so a guy I, I met who works with Perry a lot uh, John Paul Mendoza real character told me that the trick to selling is to show people what they want and then stand between them okay <laughs> I mean and 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 he's right because sometimes the only way to get somebody to acknowledge what they want is to tell them they can't have it I mean see and that that's another reason you asked about copywriters being so blunt and direct it's because we see the I don't want to say absurdity, the incongruity, the irrationality of human nature. For example, um, you know, in Christianity, there's this thing called the seven deadly sins, right? Greed, sloth. For copywriting, and I, this must be hard for some Christian copywriters, honestly, um, the seven deadly sins are a copywriter's best friend. If you can appeal to somebody's sense of envy or jealousy, you know, what... <laughs> Have you, have you seen those latest Cadillac ads where they're talking about in America 
you know, we only take two months off in August and stuff like that. I mean, that there's a certain amount of envy and pride and almost a sneering sense of superiority that that's appealing to. I bet it's working too. Right. Yeah. So I want to go back to your story a little bit, and you know, people sure. see you. Well, you know, uh, David's a successful coach, copywriter, but it wasn't always like that. Take no, me back to those days, the debt days. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I had this career with McGraw Hill. I was the bureau chief in San Francisco. Everyone thought it was the greatest job on the planet, but it wasn't me. So I, I left after a couple of years after they moved me out here from Chicago. And I, I started freelancing. I had no idea what I was doing or what I was going to do. And things kept getting worse and worse. And I started buying into some magical thinking that everything was just going to work out. But meanwhile, I wasn't making enough money. And I was going deeper and deeper and deeper into debt. And about eight years after I started my business, I hit rock bottom. I was technically bankrupt. Um, I never declared bankruptcy. Maybe I should have, but um, I did do an offer and compromise with the IRS. And the way that works, in case you've ever had the pleasure, is you take the value of everything in your home, everything around you. You put it out in the street and you sold it or you had the oh, wow. garbage people take it away. What would that be worth? You give them that and they forgive the back taxes. I don't know if you can still do that. It was pretty humiliating, needless oh, to say. Wow. And I had to borrow the money to do that. Um, well, that got me to do some, Maybe the magical thinking wasn't working so well. huh? Um, and I realized there were a couple things that I needed to do to change my fortune. And one of them was I needed to provide value before I asked for money. In other words, I didn't need to go up someone and say, oh, I'm David Garfinkel, I'm a copywriting coach, it costs $30,000, work with me, send me a check, and we'll talk. I couldn't do that. Um, the, the second thing, I, but if I spent an hour on the phone with somebody, and maybe I changed a couple headlines, and maybe I showed them how they could immediately make $130,000, they might be willing to write me a check. But the second thing I realized is the writing that I'd been doing, that I'd learned to do as a journalist, was not of value in the marketplace because while it informed people, maybe it entertained them, maybe it educated them, it didn't provide any monetary value. But copywriting did. Copywriting, you send out a letter, a check comes back. That's tangible value. You can actually mm -hmm. take the check, put it in the bank, and your bank balance goes up. I mean, really simple stuff, right? So I realized I had to provide value before I asked for money, and I realized I had to create value with the work I did. And then I you know, wrote the abacus letter, and then one thing led to another, and pretty soon I was right side up again, and things got a lot better from there. Yeah. I mean, that point in time sounds very painful. How did you, at that point, get your mind right to even go on the upward trend? Because some people, I would think, maybe just stay there for a long time and maybe don't recover from it. Well, one thing is I suffer fast. I mean, I suffer fast and I suffer hard. And, and my life has always been about change, so I, I'm not afraid to change. But... Look, I'd be lying to you if I said it, it was always easy and I, I was always positive. I wasn't. You know, it was hard. Uh, I just realized it could get better and it was going to take a while and I had to keep at it and I couldn't look at any... You know, you know there's a, a saying that you're never as, as good as your, your, your best, you know, best supporter and you're never as bad as your worst review. You know, so... I, I learned not to take anything to define me. I guess I sort of learned to define myself. I said, I'm not a failure. I just tried some stuff that didn't work. I know what that is, so now I'm going to try something different and work better. And eventually it did. So when did you first discover copywriting? Mm, I think it was a couple years 
before that low point. Um, so I had a business partner at the time, and I was teaching public speaking, of all things. And he had a friend who sent him a six-month free subscription to Gary Halbert's print newsletter, the Gary Halbert letter. And it was, you know, print at the time, cost $195 a year. And so my, my friend, my partner got it, and he said, David, this isn't for me, but it might be for you. Take a look at it. I went, all right. So I looked at it, and I read this thing. And I didn't know what he was doing, but it was like nothing I'd ever seen. So I read it again. I must have read it 20 times. And I said, I don't know what this guy's got, but I want some of it. And we kept getting the newsletter. And then maybe three or four issues in Hurricane Andrew hit. Not sure of the exact timing here, but I think, you know, while I was still getting the free subscription, Hurricane Andrew hit. And Gary was a really complex guy. You know, on the one hand, people think he was, you know, the devil incarnate. To me, he wasn't at all. He he was, you know, he was a man, a businessman, an entrepreneur. But it, there was a, a very giving, not saintly, but, you know, very generous quality to him. And so he said, I'm going to do this this um, seminar down in Key West. All you have to do is get here. You don't have to pay anything. At the end of the seminar, I'm going to ask you to figure out what it was worth to you, and you're going to write a check for that amount, not to me, but to the Red Cross for Hurricane Andrew victims. I thought, I can't lose there. So I went down there, and that, that, that literally changed my life. And I think that was a couple years before 1993. So what was it about that that changed your life when you were there? Well, I, I had a better vision of the future. I saw how I could take what I did and change it into something that would be very valuable for others and make a good living for me. Mm -hmm. And I know we talked about, I wanted to ask you about some of your most successful campaigns, and you talked about the the Abacus letter. What was mm -hmm. another one that uh, would be good to talk about? Sure. Well, um, Ann Sieg is, was the, known as the renegade, and still is, I guess, the renegade network marketer in the MLM industry. And I met her and um, ended up coaching her and her, her team. Um, I did both business coaching and copywriting coaching. And then they were doing this launch, and they ran out of you know bandwidth to write their own all of their own materials. So they were writing the content, and they were doing a membership site, and they had a sales letter. And then they had a back end. And so I... I, you know, they hired me to to write the sales letter for that, the whole funnel, actually. Oh well. Wow. And, and um, you know, typical internet marketing story: the server broke on the day of the uh, uh, the launch, but they got it back up, and they sold over a million dollars worth of memberships, not even to the entry level membership site, but to this back end mentoring program for helping people. Um, develop content-based marketing, helping network marketers develop content-based marketing. Uh, that that was huge. That one was huge. So when you develop that campaign, what do you think worked well, or what research did you find when you were kind of getting into the the gut level of what these people, what their biggest want was? That you included. Yeah, yeah. It, it took a long time. Um, I must have spent. Uh, uh, three months, um, first of all, trying to understand the network marketer's mindset because it's very different from mine. It's very different from an entrepreneurial mindset. Um, and, I mean, to understand it without judgment, to understand it not like an anthropologist looking at, you know, a foreign culture, but to understand it to the point where I could mentally be that person, feel like that person. And so I, I interviewed people. I um, I read stuff. I talked a lot to Anne and her partners. Um, I thought about it a lot, and eventually it all came together. It, 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 the research took a while. Mm -hmm. And you know what I discovered is for, for people in network marketing, making money is okay. Maybe it's a value, but much more is to be part of something that's really going somewhere and to be part of a community, to be included and to feel excited about the cause. Um, that's not the way I'm wired. I'm more of an individual, you know? 
I'm a more of a one-on-one -on -one person. I'm kind of introverted. I'm not a, a group person. So uh, no, I do have an extroverted side, and I do have a, you know, uh, I'm, so I could understand those things, but I, I had to look deep into myself to really identify with it. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I ask that because, you know, we hear, oh, there was a million-dollar launch, but, I mean, a lot goes into it. It's not like you just sat down and wrote it. You took months to research it and kind of get in the mindset of that that person or those people and the market. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's so key to the whole thing. You you have to really – and, and, and that's, the, that's the key to copywriting is to understand who you're talking to and how they want to be talked to. That's yeah. that's really a, a major secret, a major key. Sounds simple, sounds like nothing. It's everything. Yeah. yeah. And I wanna ask and I wanna ask too, I know we got started late, but um I, I wanna just pause for a second and see kind of what your time frame is. Um Yeah, maybe I can take ten, fifteen more minutes. Okay. Just wanna make sure. Thank um you. so the the other question is um why do you read the National Enquirer and you were actually and why were you actually in it? <laughs> yeah, um, so it, that's a great question and it ties right into what I was just saying. Copywriting is about talking to people the way they want to be talked to. It seems like it should be easy to write in a way that is conversational and authentic. It's actually one of the hardest things to do, even if you're already a good writer, and especially if you're not. And so that sort of gets back to what I was saying about the answer is always simple. Getting there is never simple because there's all these steps. National Enquirer is one of those shortcuts because of the way it's written. It's written in a very conversational language. Okay? And so if you read it, it starts to get into your bloodstream a little bit. It doesn't exactly get in your muscle memory, but it gets into your bloodstream it gets into some of the chatter in your mind. The reason that the National Enquirer wrote about me was, well, it's because I made them look good. You know, they've always had a little bit of a credibility problem, even though, in fact, they do a better job journalistically than some of the big names in journalism. They, and they, they do it not because uh, they thought it might be a good idea. They do it because their lawyer tells them they damn well better since they're going to be sued on a lot of their stories and they need to have their facts double checked, triple checked, you mm -hmm. know. Um, but that wasn't, but nevertheless, they had this reputation. These days, they're mild compared to things like TMZ and, you know, lots of other, but at the time, which this is, this is like 1998 when they wrote about me, um, they, you know, they were held in low esteem and they felt should have been better. And I said, I read it every week and I read it twice. I read it once because I enjoy it. And I read it once to learn about how more, how to write in, in the great way the National Enquirer writes. And mm -hmm. so you know, I'll tell you a funny story too. A little embarrassing. I knew this would lead to a funny story. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I also have a feeling you're going to get this right away. So, so the headline of the story about me was top ad exec first and last time I've ever been called an ad exec. Top ad exec. Um, uh, top ad exec uh, owes all of his success to the National Enquirer. So I thought my mom would be really proud of that. She was furious. She said, no, you don't. You owe all of your success to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah, like I said, seven deadly sins, envy, jealousy, that's what runs humanity. The other reason I thought you were Bill Belichick is this. So oftentimes I'll ask, what are some of your favorite headlines that work best or favorite hooks? So when mm -hmm. I look at the document, I see a big line crossed out. And so what's the better question? Well, see, I don't... I don't even know. I mean, there are, there are people like my really good friend John Carlton who can tell you his best headlines because they've been ripped off a thousand times. I don't remember. But to me, I, I take more of the point, you know, I look at things more, I take more of the point of view of a coach and a teacher. I look at the headlines that have worked best across time 
across many industries, across many promotions. And that's why and how I put my book, Advertising Headlines That Make You Rich, that's how I put it together because I wanted people to have stuff that they could use so they wouldn't go through what I went through. It was very painful for me to learn copywriting. It, was, it didn't understand why after I'd already been such a successful writer, but it was a very different kind of writer. But anyway, um, so, I mean, you know, I, 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 like, I like those headlines, but I don't know if they're my favorite headlines or my favorite hooks. I like what works. I like being able to empower other people and um, give them, you know, tools they can use. I really like helping entrepreneurs with what they do a lot. In fact, you know, I have a course called High Speed Copywriting, and Bond Halbert, who's Gary's son and has become a very good friend of mine, said that this is the best course for teaching entrepreneurs how to write their own copy, which was the highest compliment he could have paid me because that's really my mission. I'm not, even though I've worked with a lot of top writers, I don't consider myself a top writer. I consider myself a pretty good one, but I consider myself the top coach. And there are a lot more entrepreneurs to coach than there are top writers, and I really like entrepreneurs a lot. So being able to help entrepreneurs, you know, that that's that's more, you know, meaningful to me, I guess. Yeah. So what's something in the advertising headlines that make you rich that people should know? Okay, uh, it's not actually a headline. I mean, I can I can give you a bunch of headlines, but you can you can you can open up the book on Amazon and and you'll see the headlines in the table of contents for free. The, um, the I think the most important thing is that we as people respond to structures. There are certain structures of headlines of sales pitches of um, of promises that simply light up our neurology in a positive way. The nucleus accumbens, the thing that makes you feel good and makes you want to buy something. And the, the key thing is to understand the structures. It's, it's like I work with a lot of guys in the dating industry. It's not about the pickup line. It's about understanding how to talk to a woman and understanding how to listen. It's a structure. It's it's a. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not sure I'm being very articulate mm -hmm, here. Mm -hmm. I think it gets into what I was going to ask next: is crafting a structure, crafting a story to keep people interested. What do you do to craft a story to keep people interested? Okay, so I'll I'll sort of start at the, you know at the conceptual level and zero in. Um, <clears throat> we are wired as a species to respond to stories. Um, there are a lot of people who believe, and I'm one of them, that that's how we, that's, that's how we survived as a species because stories are a way to pass down knowledge, useful knowledge, protective knowledge, and because a story is in an entertaining form, it it's like sugarcoating the, the medicine or something. It make, makes it easy. So right. we, we want to hear stories. There, and, and, you know, this is why, you know, I mean, it sounds pretty crazy that hundreds of people would line up to sit in a chair about the size of the one I'm sitting in. People on either side of them texting and eating popcorn and farting and, and, and you know, making noise and, and watch this thing on a screen. But they do. They go to movie theaters every weekend to do that. Why? That's why. Because a really good story, well told, is just unbeatable. Okay. So with copywriting, when to craft a story in copywriting, I've identified about five structures of stories. And one of them I'll tell you about that works really well for anybody. And I think you have a lot of entrepreneurs that will be watching this, yeah? So. Yeah. Let's say you're introducing a new product to market, not not new in the sense that no one's ever heard of this kind of product, but yours is new and different, has something new and different about it, and um, and hopefully that new and different is either it's cheaper or it works better or works faster or it gets rid of a problem another one had some unique advantage that you know about. So 
there's a story called a herald story, like a herald in a Shakespearean play. And a herald story is, that, remember, the herald is the guy who comes in with the, the long trumpet. Mm, to yes, yes. Announcing. So that's what a herald story is. You, you, you say that there was this problem, and you or somebody else couldn't solve it, and it was causing these kind of dire consequences. And so you or somebody else came up with this new solution that was different from the other solutions because it's cheaper, it's more convenient, it's safer, it works better, whatever the advantage is, and, and, and this is how you can get it. Now, that's, that's a particular story structure that will work very well because what it does is it sort of sugarcoats the education of why you should have this new product, what's different about it, in, in a story format. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that. And one of my favorite, uh, actually, videos that I watch of you on YouTube is actually when you go through, and because I've been searching, kind of yearning to find out what are some great books about stories, and you actually, I finally found your YouTube video, and you actually go through, do you remember what I'm talking about? Where you go through the different books that yeah, you like, recommend that are great was, uh, for stories. Sure. I, I yeah. think one, one of them is um, Story by Robert McKee, and Another yeah. one is Stealing Fire. From, I'll, I'll add another one that yeah. I've discovered since then, uh, which I think you'd like. It's called Wired for Story, and I don't remember the author's name. I'll have to uh, check it out. But it's, yeah, you can find it. it yeah. It, it, it's great. In fact, Kevin Halpert told me about that book, uh, Bond's Brother. Or I'm going to check that out. Um, so we talked about some of the painful points, um, and tell me about one of your proudest accomplishments what you're amazed that you were able to accomplish in your career? You know, um, frankly, the million dollar sales letter, the 40 million, I'm not unproud of them, but I'm more proud of my students. <clears throat> I'm more proud of Mike Morgan getting like the number one um, uh, uh, producing sales letter in all of Agora Financial. Um, I'm, I'm really proud of Chris Haddad opening up his own publishing company and making ungodly sums of money, even though I'm sure he is a very godly man. Um, uh, yeah, seriously, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of him. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of Vin Montello for rising to the top on ClickBank. You know, and I could go on and on. It's, it's when my students succeed, uh, when they get better than me as copywriters, which, and I find that the better a person is, the more I can help them, by the way. Mm. Um, and, and when I help a business owner, yeah, I had this one guy, I think it's kind of almost safe to talk about this now. Now that medical marijuana, now that recreational marijuana is legal in uh, Colorado and Washington and all across the country. So, uh, Big Mike was his name. Mike Stromatis. He was CEO of a company up in Vancouver, Washington, uh, called Advanced Nutrients. Advanced Nutrients, as in uh, hydroponic nutrients for growing oh, indoor yeah. marijuana. And um, he hired me. CEOs don't usually hire me. He hired me to help him learn right to copy. And Mike, brilliant guy, hadn't finished high school. He did it. He learned it. He, I mean, he, God, he worked hard to do it. Became a world-class copywriter. But more importantly, he, inserted, not infused. He, he, he. He wove the cop, direct response copywriting culture throughout his whole company. <clears throat> and he, he sent me this one email one day. It was from a customer. And the guy said, I hate to read your emails because every time I read one, I, I feel forced to buy whatever you're selling. And the damn thing about it is every promise that you make, you live up to. And Mike said, so I can see that our work was successful. And it's a $50 million company. And he right. said a lot of the growth had to do with the work we did together. I'm so proud of that. So how does someone like that find you? Um, usually, um, you know, have you ever heard of Shoemaker's Children? Yes. Yeah, Shoemaker's Children have no shoes. Uh, usually it's through something like this. It's, it's through some kind of video like this because I'm absolutely terrible at conventional marketing. I don't even have a business card. Uh, <laughs> supposed to know that's my business card no I don't have one um, yeah I mean uh, it's easy to find me it's david at davidgarfinkel.com uh, you know I even I don't like to take phone calls but my phone number is published on the internet 
I usually like have appointments with people and stuff. But yeah, I'm pretty easy to find, pretty easy to contact. Yeah. So David, I'm oh, oh, oh wait, I thought of something else. Yeah. I just remembered. I, I did put up a page called GarfinkelCoaching.com, and it describes my services and even has forms. Silly me. I it's so even... top of mind that you almost forgot it. <laughs> it is, yeah. <laughs> but I have one last question for you, David. I appreciate your time. But before I ask sure. it, I want you to tell people where they can find out more. So this will be, I guess, the plug to for them to go check out whatever whatever's going on and what you're working on lately. Sure. Okay. So... First of all, go to Amazon and buy Breakthrough Copywriting. Here's why. That, that was originally a $5,000 course. I bought, obviously, not everything's in there, but it's the best bargain in copywriting today. Um, if you and can't make your $10 back, then that's then, not, a, then or, not, a good, you know, not a good thing. Or refund the money, you know. I mean, go, go buy some stuff at Starbucks. I mean, whatever you need to do, right? Uh, and as Amazon has a very generous refund policy. And then... The second thing is, um, so, yeah, I mean, do that. Also, I'm putting together a new book. I think a lot of your readers will like this because in, in researching your website, it looks like a lot of your people are stars in their niches, right? They're real stars in niches. So my, my new book is called Breakthrough Copywriting Mass Desire, How to Move Your Business from Niche to Household Name. And if when you that buy the That sounds great. Thank you. So when you, when you buy one book, you know, you're on the list for any other releases by the same author. Um, so, uh, uh, and, and maybe when you're editing this, you can put these up on the screen. Uh, you can go to um, highspeedcopywriting.com. There's, a, um, there, there's a, a video sales letter there for a course, especially for entrepreneurs. Um, if you want lots of resources, if you've studied, okay, uh, so here's a, a direct Bill Belichick style attack on all of my colleagues competitors if you've studied everyone else's stuff and you still can't make it work go to fasteffectivecopy.com and all of the stuff in there will help you put it all together I've heard this over and over and over again about mm -hmm. my stuff um, and then um, if you you know um, Oh, Advertising Headlines That Make You Rich is, is my other book on Amazon. A lot of people like it. Some people don't because the only there's, it's not, there's not a lot of filler. There's not a lot of fluff. You know, one of my um, mentors, Don Hauptman, a guy in New York, uh, said, consumers buy information by the pound. Uh, business people will pay money to save time. So I, I tend to write more for business people than consumers. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So it, it stuns me that I'm a best-selling author because I never thought I had that mass appeal. But now that I do, I'm going to write a book about mass appeal. Well, you've appeal. been working on it for decades, you know, as a writer in general. So That's true. I'm not so surprised. Yeah, <laughs> all right, I won't. Um, and you you have something big brewing, too, that you can't really talk about. Mm, yeah. <clears throat> it's, uh, I can tell you this. It, I'm under a non-disclosure agreement, so everything I'm going to say is going to be pretty vague. But I'm working with a a team of a couple other experts on selling a business in Silicon Valley and this is in the same league as the WhatsApp or um, uh, you know that company Apple just bought um, I mean th this is this could be a ten-figure or even no it won't be eleven figure it could be a nine-figure ten-figure deal and I'm using the same skills the same thinking that that I teach people and then I use copywriting, you know, putting together simple documents because it is so important to communicate your idea to a potential buyer. And, you know, one of the things I've learned, because I, after I did a few things with IBM and uh, United Airlines and Time Life, I, I, I stepped out of the corporate arena, is that senior executives, um, especially CEOs, but also the guys at the C-level just under that and directors on boards of directors, they really measure their life in seconds. And I've heard this over and over again. If you can't get their attention in five or ten seconds, forget it. You're out. Done. No second chance. So, you know, it's, it's, really, it's really getting me to take my skills to a new level to figure out how to get the message across that quickly and still make it plausible, even credible. Yeah. Even, even factual. Yeah. Well, I look forward when when that comes out, or when you whenever you can share it, you will. Uh, 
I'm going to post like a little excerpt, like a five-minute or ten-minute excerpt of you talking about it at some point. Maybe it's five I, years from now. I, w I would love to talk about yeah. it. Um, the, um, the, the buttons that have sealed my lips are, are starting to weigh, but I have to keep <laughs> my mouth shut. A little my bit. last question, David, and I appreciate your time, especially the technical difficulties, is you know, every picture I see of you, you're nicely clean and shaven. So I like the beard, but why, why do you have the beard now? Um, well, I got tired of shaving, and I actually had a beard um, when I when I left McGraw Hill in 1985. And for some reason, I shaved it off, and I guess I've just come full circle. You know, I feel like um, this time. Well, all right, I'm going to tell you something I've rarely, um, and it, it's 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 pretty Bill Belichick like. So, really, sh I've never shared this in public, and I may live to regret it, but. You know that guy on the uh, on the uh, I can't believe I'm telling you this. You know you know that guy on the Dos Equis commercial. I rarely drink, but when I yes. do, and so he's they call him the most interesting man in the world. And you would think by watching that commercial that he's a Spaniard or a Mexican, right? I make he's that not. assumption. Yeah, he's not. He's a Jew from the South Bronx. Really? Yeah, really. Check it out. He's an actor, and he's Jew. So I thought, well, I'm a Jew from, you know, Montgomery County, Maryland, and <laughs> I would like nothing better than to walk in the room, and even if I can't be the most interesting man in the world, the second most interesting man in the world, because he's probably not going to be there, so I'd be the most interesting man in the room. And then I have this really competitive, I call her a hair maintenance specialist. I I do not call her a hairdresser. This really competitive woman, Meg, and I mean she's really smart and and really hard driving. She said, "David, forget this second most. You're going to be the most interesting man in the world." And I said, "Okay." So that I think that was more like the um, intellectual justification for the beard. the The reason was I got tired of shaving. That's the same with me, and my wife likes it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And 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 that's that's important. My girlfriend likes it, and if she didn't, off it would come. It goes exactly. Just like that. Yeah. So that's the real reason. Now you got it. My girlfriend likes it. I thought there was a good story behind it, so I appreciate you sharing and opening up thing about. I I, I may I may live to regret this, or if you know I get like they bump him off the commercial and they say, hey, we like this Garfinkel. We're gonna try him. I'll I'll have you to thank. I'll I'll make sure you get beer every week. Thank you. David, mm -hmm. it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. It's my pleasure is mine. Thank you, Jeremy. Mm -hmm.